Well, good morning. He has risen. He has risen, risen indeed. Thank you so much for inviting me to this sunrise service, and I trust the sun will make itself known here shortly. I do appreciate, I think, with all those who've spoken to you over the years, the fact that you've established tradition of gathering on Galilee and worshiping our resurrected Lord. And I thank you for inviting me. My name is Matt and Aya, and I'm not one of the apostles or someone well known like Peter and John. In fact, my salvation is a result of their witness to the resurrection. And yet I still have a story to tell about the truth of our risen Lord. Let me begin with a little background. My family is a long line of Levites. We were um, servants in the temple, in the tabernacle. In the days of King David, we were guardians of the storehouses of the temple uh, under Solomon. And uh, when our people returned from exile, those offices were reestablished. And one of my early ancestors who bore my name, Matt Nile, was the captain of the temple guards in those early years of the second temple. When the temple was rebuilt by Herod, the temple guards were greatly expanded, and uh, we became, in essence, a, a small army for the use of the king. Unfortunately, often for his nefarious and evil uses, but still we continued to do our duties in the temple grounds. My father was a member of the temple guard when Herod rebuilt the temple, and I, when I was young, I remember going often with my father and mother, walking through the temple buildings, looking at the work that was continuing to be done and marveling at the fact that God had given us this place for his presence to dwell and his power to be made known. In those days, my mother and father both told me over and over the stories of how God had protected and returned to his temple. Stories of supernatural intervention, as in the time of Jehoshaphat. Stories of human endeavor, as in the revolt of the Maccabees. And I began to feel at that time that, that the temple was the center of God's plan, that, that he would always be present, that he would always return, that he would also come in power to that beautiful place. I became very, very loyal to the work of the temple and of the guards. Toward the end of Herod's reign, my father became captain of the temple guards, and that's when things started to go bad for us as a family. My father became embittered and cynical, and, and I think I know the reasons. I remember clearly one night waking up and hearing my father and mother having an argument. She said to him, you, you can't do that. It's just not right. You have to refuse. And my father said, if I will refuse, Herod will just have me killed, as he had so many others, and you, and our boys. Do you want our boys to suffer the same fate as the boys of Bethlehem? No. From that time on, my father seemed resigned to the service of Herod, cynical, embittered, and ultimately evil himself. I remember being finally estranged from my father when he served Herod by first arresting and then executing the young man who had climbed up on the temple gate to remove Herod's idolatrous golden eagle. I swore at that time that I would not become like my father, that I would continue to defend the temple and its honor and its purity, and I would hate and do violence only to those who threatened the temple. Shortly after that, Herod died, and his sons were made kings, but not over Judea. In Judea, we had a governor sent by the Romans, and the temple guard was reduced back to a fairly normal size, and the high priesthood took over charge of the temple guard. And the high priesthood was 
political office. They, they were appointed by the Romans. They were frequently unlearned in the ways of the temple and its sacrifices, but they did try to protect the, the rituals of temple worship, right? and they were sworn to protect the country from revolts and, and deceptions and plots. And in that, they used the temple guard, not as Herod did, but still used the temple guard to, to sniff out and put down anything that might threaten the temple. About the same time my father died, and I mourned him, but not over much, for he had remained to the end of his life uh, an embittered and cruel man. But because it was family tradition, I joined the temple guards. And because of his reputation, I was looked on well by the Romans and the Herodians and even the high priests. So I began to rise through the ranks. And during that time, they began to use me to consolidate their power, to carry out their schemes. But fortunately, in those years, the, the schemes that they sniffed out, the things that they made me do, even the murders that they made me commit, were things that went along with my ideal of protecting the temple from all outsiders and from all impurity. And so we got along for those years. In, uh, at the time of, of Pontius Pilate, I, I had risen up through the ranks, and I was made captain of the temple guard. That was the years when Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. And Annas and Caiaphas connived against Pilate and caused him to order the temple guard to be expanded. And some of our old policing duties that we'd had under Herod were added back in, even with permission to go outside the city of Jerusalem to carry out the desires of the high priesthood. And so I was made captain of the guard in those years, and I worked together with Caiaphas, often reporting to him directly. But my day-to-day -day contact was with a priest named Malchus. Malchus and I got along. In fact, we became friends. I was always striving to protect the purity of the temple and its physical place. Malchus was the one who strove to protect the temple ritual and the sacrifices and offerings and maintain them, even when the high priests were ignorant of what they were supposed to do. Even on the Day of Atonement, he walked them through it, and it always went well. Malchus and I talked often as to whether the holiness of the place sanctified the offerings and sacrifices, or whether the sacrifices and offerings sanctified the place. But we agreed that it was precious and needed to be protected. As captain of the Temple Guard, one of my jobs was to sniff out any possible threats to the temple, the priesthood, and the Sanhedrin. And so I was one of the first to hear of this man named Jesus, a man in Galilee who was attracting great crowds. And we heard by report that he was doing miracles, casting out demons, and teaching with great authority. Shortly after we had put down John the Baptist and stopped his fledgling revolt, I went to Malchus and he to Caiaphas with a report on this man, Jesus. And I was told to keep a close eye on him, especially if he tried to come into Judea. As I investigated, I found he had already been in Judea twice. First, he had come while John was still baptizing in the Jordan River. And the report I heard was that he himself had been baptized and there had been some kind of thundering miracle that went along with that. The second time, he had come during Passover and had come to the temple itself. I remembered hearing some vague report of this, but my guards, my men, had not told me the whole thing, probably because they had found themselves incapable of stopping it. I now learned that he had come to the temple and he had gone into the court of the Gentiles 
and begun to overthrow the tables of the money changers and, and to, to chase, to, to release the beasts and to chase the traders out of the temple area. Now, I, I sympathized that the use of the court of the Gentiles for trading was not the right use of it in God's plan and God's temple. But that was what was being done, and I stood behind it. If I had been there, I would have arrested him. So we kept watch on him even more closely. And two reports came to my ears that made a huge difference to me. One was a second witness to the temple events came and said that he had heard Jesus say that he would destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. Destroy the temple! What could make anyone more an enemy of God than that thought? When he became an enemy of God, he became my enemy. And I soon wanted deep in my heart to stop this rebel Galilean scum, as I thought of him in those days. The second report that came to my ears was that in talking with the Pharisees in Galilee, he had said that he was greater than the temple greater than the temple, a man, a mere man, it couldn't be. And so Jesus became my enemy, and I watched for him closely. And it was in the spring of the following year that we began to hear that he had gathered together his small band of followers and was coming to Jerusalem. I didn't think this small group could be any military threat. My squads of temple guards alone could probably deal with them without even breaking a sweat. But the miracles that I had heard of made me cautious. A week or so before Passover, I heard that he had excuse me, arrived at the town of Bethany. And there we were told he had done some great miracle of healing, even the rumors of raising someone from the dead and gathering even more of his followers. Every day after that, I stood on the city wall above the gate, looking out over the Kidron Valley as the streams of pilgrims coming to the feast got thicker and thicker. And on the day after the Sabbath, I noticed coming down the Mount of Olives, a large throng of pilgrims gathered together. As they came down across the valley, they began to, I began to hear them shouting, Hosanna! and repeating the line from the psalm, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I signaled my guards to be on alert, and the Romans came out of their guardhouse as well. And as they came up the hill toward me, I saw in the center of the group a man sitting on a donkey's colt, and the acclamation swirling around him, palm branches and leaves being thrown at his feet. And I thought, this must be Jesus. No one else could receive this kind of acclaim without it being someone I had known. So I gathered up six or so of my guards by eye. We went out through the gate and walked toward the oncoming mob. Others followed, people from Jerusalem joining in the acclaim. And as they got closer, I saw the man, saw his rugged face. And my first impression was one of sadness as he looked up at the temple and at Jerusalem. My second impression was when he looked over at a little child waving a branch, and his face was filled with joy. And I was taken back. I had expected the, the scheming face of a terrorist or the, the, the cautious face of a rebel, but I had not expected this. And, and for that, for some reason, I let him go by and into the city. As soon as he was passed, I realized what I had done. My, my hatred for him surged. I had let him get in front of me, between me and the temple. So I went in through the gate and went by back ways and arrived at the temple courts before he did. I gathered another squad, the squad at the temple, and we were ready for him. I told them there will be no disruptions here. And there were disruptions there. Jesus came in and looked around with a scornful look on his face, and I did nothing. <laughs>
he walked into the court of the Gentiles and began to knock over the tables of the money changers. He took a, a whip off a post by the animals and began to drive them out of the area. And I did nothing. My men did nothing. Someone came up and, and shook me and I did nothing. Jesus said, my father's house is supposed to be a place of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves and I did nothing. Jesus talked to a few of the priests. He went, turned, gathered his followers, and left the courtyard. And only then did my rage release itself, and I grabbed the guards, and we chased after him. But we couldn't find him. I was enraged. I was furious. How could I have let this man walk right into the temple courts, knowing his plans, knowing his schemes, knowing the threat to God's place and God's power, and do nothing. I, I, I know now that God's hand was on me, but I had no idea what it was then. When I went and reported this to Malchus and then to Caiaphas, I was amazed to find that they thought I had done the right thing. They didn't want him arrested publicly for fear of a revolt. Caiaphas said to me, we have a plan to arrest him quietly. Do nothing until the plan goes into effect. I said, the man is a rebel. The man has designs on the temple and you want me to do nothing? And they said, no. And so I let him teach in my temple all that week. I even saw him and his followers gesturing at the buildings, undoubtedly scheming how to bring them down. But I couldn't touch him, except in my hatred. Toward the end of the week, on the day the Passover lambs were sacrificed, toward evening, I finally got a, a message from Caiaphas. And when I came to him, he said that their plan was going into effect that a traitor had betrayed Jesus and would take us to a quiet place, and there we were to arrest him. Malchus came with the traitor, a man named Judas, and we gathered people from the temple servants and a guard of my soldiers and went out. In the city, many were still celebrating the Passover Seder, but when we went through the gates, the night was dark, and we went across the Kidron Valley and up to a little garden. As we went, Judas, the betrayer, said that he would identify the man by kissing him on both ah. cheeks. And when we arrived, there was a group of men getting up, some still rubbing sleep out of their eyes, and the man in the center was Jesus. Judas went up and greeted him, kissed him. I was right behind, and Jesus turned and looked at me and said, who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. And at that moment, I was struck by a force in my chest, and I tumbled backwards on my men. And as we're scrambling to our feet, Jesus said again, whom do you seek? And I said, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> and he said, I have told you, I am he. So let these men go. And at that point, he stepped forward to go with us. But one of his followers, coming from behind, came with a sword and reached out and sliced at Malchus, cutting his ear off. I had my sword drawn, and I was ready to slay all of them. But Jesus said, enough. And he reached down and touched Malchus's ear. Malchus straightened and looked at me and said, I'm healed. Jesus had gone and spoken with his men, and they slunk off into the darkness. Cowards, I thought. We'll have no more trouble with them. And then we took Jesus and brought him to the city. I stood as his guard as he talked to the Sanhedrin, and witnesses were brought, poor witnesses, very bad witnesses. They apparently hadn't been paid enough. 
They couldn't agree on their testimony. Finally, two were brought, the two who had been my informers when Jesus revealed his plan to destroy the temple. And as they talked, my anger rekindled itself. And when Jesus said something that I thought might be offensive to the high priest, I slapped him hard across the face, wishing I could do more. Caiaphas questioned him and finally challenged him to affirm or deny that he claimed to be the Son of God, and Jesus affirmed it. Blasphemy, Caiaphas said. This man deserves death. And the Sanhedrin agreed. And then I held him by, from behind by his arms as they walked by him, spit in his face, mocked him, slapped him and said, tell us, prophet, who hit you? And when the rage had abated, Caiaphas told Malchus and I to take Jesus to Pilate. If Malchus hadn't been along, Jesus would have died at that moment, trying to escape. But as it was, we turned him over to Pilate's soldiers, and they took him inside. I didn't go in, but I remained outside, and the temple servants came and gathered a crowd. Finally, Pilate came out with Jesus and another, and he said, who do you want me to release to you, this man Barabbas? a man we had captured for leading a riot in the city, or Jesus, the Messiah. And the crowd, coached by the temple servants, cried, Release Barabbas! Crucify Jesus! Pilate washed his hands of the affair and sentenced Jesus to flogging and crucifixion. Exultant as I was over his death, I cringed slightly. For though I was a man of violence myself, I had never grown accustomed to the cruel tortures of the Romans. They did torture and flog him cruelly within an inch of his life. And then they dragged him out, carrying his cross to Golgotha and crucified him. I remained in the city, strengthening the guards against any riot that might ensue. And about noon, great darkness fell. My men were worried. And about three o'clock, a great cry went up, seeming to fill an echo off the sky. And at that moment, we began to hear a commotion from the temple. And the priests who had been serving in the holy place came out. And they reported to us that the veil that stood between the holy place and the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom. How can this be? Even in his suffering, this man had succeeded in attacking the place I was sworn to defend, the very place of the presence of God. Now I knew that there was nothing behind that curtain, no Ark of the Covenant, no presence of God's just a stone floor covered with blood stains, But it was still his place. This was the place God would return to in power when he made his presence known to us, when he suddenly came to the temple, as the prophets had promised. How could this Jesus, even in his suffering, have done this? The next day was a Sabbath. And a busy Sabbath, the temple guard, like the priests, had freedom to do what we needed to do on that day. And as I came on in the morning, I was called by Caiaphas. Caiaphas said, this blasphemer has been buried in a tomb near Golgotha, and we have obtained permission from Pilate to let you go outside the city and guard that tomb. Those who told us that he would destroy the temple also told us that he would rebuild it in three days. And Judas, the betrayer, told us that he thought that was a symbolic statement, that he had told them he would rise in three days. So go, take a guard and keep his tomb safe. And so we did. Malchus came and led me to the tomb, showed me which one. He was constantly 
<laughs> rubbing his ear. I asked him if it felt all right. He said it, it felt perfect. <laughs> and so we posted a guard, and I stayed with them most of the day. But as evening fell and nothing had happened, I went back and caught a few hours of sleep in my quarters. Arising early in the morning, I encountered Caiaphas also awake, and just at that moment, the leader of the guard came in, and he said that just before dawn, a group of women had been heard coming toward the temple, women's voices, but before they were identified, a great earthquake had occurred, shaking the temple, rolling the stone away, and a being, a terrifying man, had descended from the sky. His face was like lightning, his clothes, he said, was white as snow, and as he came to the ground, the whole guard, my man reported, was so terrified that they fainted dead away. They woke some time later. The sun had already risen, the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. When Caiaphas heard this, he went to consult with others of the Sanhedrin. Shortly, he called me in. He said, Matt and I, your men are under great stress. He held out his hand, and Malchus handed him a, a heavy bag of money. He said, divide this up among the men and have them report that the body was stolen by the disciples while they were asleep. Asleep? My men would never sleep on duty, and if it was heard of us, Pilate would disband the whole of the temple guard. Caiaphas said, if report reaches the governor's ears, we will keep you safe. And so my men told that story, and it was believed for the most part. It's still being told to this day. But I continue to hear rumors of a resurrection. The feast ended quietly. The Galileans, as far as we could tell, all went back to Galilee. Nothing happened in the city except these few persistent rumors that this man, Jesus, had been seen alive. Toward the end of that time, as the Feast of Pentecost approached, we heard rumors that the Galileans had regathered and were staying in a house in the city itself. And then on the day of Pentecost, the strangest story of all, a, a story of, of power being shed abroad at that house, and of Peter, the, the leader of the followers of Jesus, the one who had cut off Malchus's ear, speaking and saying that Jesus, though we had killed him, was alive, he had risen from death, and that men should turn to him and be baptized and receive forgiveness. And apparently a large part of that crowd did, thousands. So that now they again constituted a threat to the city and to the temple, a threat that Rome would finally have to snuff out. I went to Malchus, I went to Caiaphas at once. Caiaphas said, keep a close watch on them. If they do anything, arrest them. Some days after that, I was checking the guard at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. And I saw two of them coming up the steps, Peter and another, John. And as they came closer, I noticed that sitting opposite me, crying out for alms, was a beggar, a man I knew, a man who was completely crippled. As they passed by, he cried out to them. Peter and John turned and talked with them. I didn't hear what they said, but then after a little while, Peter reached out his hand and raised his voice and said, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man did. <laughs> he rose up and they went into the portico. He was walking and leaping and praising God. And I said to myself, what is happening here? There is power, power in these men, power coming back to the temple, but always associated with the hated name of this Jesus 
I went in and a crowd had gathered and Peter was telling them the story of Jesus, how God had blessed him and blessed his works, but how we, and he looked at me at that moment, how we and the leaders of our people had put him to death, but God raised him from the dead and exalted him to heaven. And he was coming back and he would offer forgiveness and new life. And they were to repent and turn from their sins and receive the refreshing that he offered now and from heaven. And many did. I didn't stay to hear because I went inside, found Caiaphas, found some of the Sanhedrin and brought them back out. I said, this is the time we must arrest this man. They are gathering an army to destroy our temple. Caiaphas listened only momentarily. He said, Matt and I are your right. Arrest them now. They offered no resistance. It was late in the day, so I put them in the temple prison. And I was surprised as I left to see, Matt, to see Malchus going in. Why are you here, I asked him. I'm to gather testimony for tomorrow's trial, he said. I knew Malchus well enough to know when he was lying to me, but I had no idea what was really going on. The next day, the men were brought before the Sanhedrin, and they were asked, in what name and by what power they did this. And they said, it is in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, but whom God raised, that this great miracle has been done. It is in his name that salvation is found, and no other. For it is the name of Jesus alone that saves. Turn then, I said, find forgiveness for your sins. And again, the man Peter seemed to be looking at me. The council was in a quandary. They didn't know what to do because the healed man was standing right there next to us. And so they colluded that in order to prevent a riot from starting, they must simply warn these men and release them. I was appalled. Why not kill them now? Why not cut the head off this rebellion? If this went on, our temple would be taken over, our place destroyed, God's power and God's presence would no longer have its home in the world. That night, I slept fitfully, concerned that possibly these men were right. Could it be that Jesus had meant his own body, that his was the temple that was destroyed and raised again in three days, that he was the presence of God among us? Even if so, what would that mean for my temple? What would that mean for the beauty and the, and, and the wonder and the presence of this place where God would come again to dwell? Even if they were right, they must be destroyed. Not many days later, a report came to the Sanhedrin, not from me, but of something that drove them into a rage of jealousy similar to my own toward these men. Caiaphas sought me out and he said, arrest them again. And I went out, I knew where to find them. They were the place they normally were, Solomon's Portico, and again they offered no resistance. And I placed them in the same cell they had been in. But as I tried to go to sleep that night, the same rage, the same thoughts filled my head, and I concluded that the, the Sanhedrin might not do anything again, but that I would do something this time. When the night got quiet, I got up, bound my sword to my side, and went to the temple prison. I was surprised when the guard told me that Malchus had gone in ahead of me. 
and as I walked quietly down the hall, hall, I heard him talking to Peter and John. They startled when I put my key in the lock, and Malchus turned to me and said, Matt Nias, why are you here? I said, I could ask the same question of you. Have you become a counselor to prisoners? Malchus looked over at Peter and John, hoping they would speak. Peter said, no, Malchus, if this man is your friend, you must tell him the good news. Malchus turned, without meeting my eyes, said, I have become a follower of Jesus, a follower of the way. What? What is this? He said, when he, when he healed my ear, I, I felt God's power at work, power I had never known before in all my years of temple service. And after he was crucified, I was overwhelmed with guilt. Guilt for my sin, guilt for my silence, guilt for my complicity in his death. And afterwards, when I began to hear stories saying that he was alive and that he forgave sins, I could not help myself. When Peter and John were here weeks ago, I came to them and they told me the good news and I turned and repented of my sins and found his forgiveness and the power of God and the presence of God in my life through his Holy Spirit. And I urge you, Matt and I, I urge you to turn from your ignorance, to turn from your sin, to receive forgiveness and refreshing and the true presence of God. Almost, almost I was persuaded. But I realized that even if true, this meant the end of the temple, and that God's presence would never return to it, that God's power would never go forth from it, and my anger rose in me yet again. Malchus, I said, leave us. He looked at Peter and John and they nodded. I listened as he went through the door. His footsteps echoed down the hall. He spoke to the guard at the gate. It opened and closed. And then I drew my sword and stepped toward the two chained men. I don't know how you have swayed so many from the holy place of God, but you will not sway me. I raised my sword. And as I did, I glanced at it momentarily. That sword that had done so many deeds, some righteous, many evil. I thought of my father's sword that had done so much evil, evil at Bethlehem and the temple gates and in the royal palace. And I realized in that moment that I did not have to do this thing. The Sanhedrin could recommend it if they found him, them guilty. Pilate could do it if they found them a threat. But I did not have to be the one to do it. I sheathed my sword. I said to them, leave my friend alone. And I carefully locked the doors and the gates. The next morning, the Sanhedrin called for them again. And a squad of my soldiers went and the leader of that squad came back. And he said that the gates were locked, the doors were locked, the guards were at their posts, and there was no one in the prison. <laughs> the power of God, I thought again, and then I quashed that thought. <laughs> Caiaphas, somewhat exasperated, told me to go find those men. And as I left, a soldier came up and reported 
that they were in their normal place in the temple, teaching the people, and worshiping Jesus. I took only one soldier with me. I didn't figure at that point that force would do any good. And when I walked up, Peter and John sighed and greeted me warmly and accompanied me back to the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas warned them, I told you not to teach or do anything in the name of this man Jesus. And Peter said, boldly, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers has raised this Jesus from the dead, and he is God's salvation. Turn and believe in him. And he said much more, throwing the council into a long debate. But I heard none of the rest of it. The God of our fathers has raised this Jesus from death. Turn to him and believe. Receive forgiveness for your sins. At that moment, I realized that my allegiance to the, the stones of the temple was foolishness. As foolishness as Malchus's allegiance to, to the blood of bulls and goats. Jesus was the true presence and the true power of God. And Jesus was the true sacrifice for sins and his victory and his presence and the power of God was shown in his resurrection. And at that point, my allegiance simply and incontrovertibly changed. And I became not the temple's man, but Jesus' man. And my soul was flooded with his presence and I have known his power from that moment on. And as he filled me, I took my sword in my hand and I put it down on the stone of the temple. And I walked out to find my friend. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, by your resurrection, you have become that true temple for us. The place of God's presence, the place of God's power, the place of God's forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters here that we would never put anything above you, even good things, and that we would always find in you the power and the comfort of your Holy Spirit and his presence in our lives. Lord Jesus, that we would always find in you forgiveness for our sins and new life. Thank you, Jesus.